Hi, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to my weekly podcast about spirituality, love, death, devotion, and waking up while living in a messy world. The Satsang with Shambhavi podcast is recorded live each week with students of our nonprofit community, Jayakula. For more information and to find out about attending a satsang, visit jayakula.org. Thanks for listening. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. I wanted to talk about that teaching that I posted earlier this week. It's just so beautiful. This is the one from the Tao Te Ching, and that's the central text of Taoism. This is loosely from uh, Ming's translation. He's a teacher who taught me how to do divination. And he died a couple of years ago. But he lived in Oakland, California for the whole time I knew him. Um, I met him in like 2001, something like that. And he created a translation of the Tao Te Ching. He taught the Tao Te Ching for 30 years, maybe more. Um, so it's it's really not a literal word-for-word translation. It's not not that, but it's really sort of an intertwining of a literal translation in his decades of engagement with the text. So it's really very much a practitioner-teacher's interpretation. So the adept has no fixed heart-mind. And heart and mind are the same. That's If we're talking about the wisdom heart, it's mm. not the brain. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of different ways we could understand that. One of the ways is that the adept has no fixed sense of self in the ordinary sense. So we have a feeling of self, of selfness, that comes from everywhere, that comes from reality. That's never going to go away. But this fixed sense of self that we have, our small sense of self, the adept doesn't have that. I also came across this wonderful sculptor today. I forget his name. I think his last name was something like Doniger. I don't know. But he creates these portraits of people and animals and landscapes that when you're looking at them, you see the portrait or you see the landscape or you see the animal. But as you walk around it, you see that the whole thing is made up of this collection of junk Mm -hmm. with like huge holes in it and baby doll heads and (laughs) playing cards and garbage and random bits of plastic. Have you seen these? (laughs) Yeah, they're pretty amazing. Yeah, so this is kind of a way of thinking about what the self really is. It's something that looked at from one perspective is some sort of unified, solid, comprehensible thing. But then when you change your perspective, it just becomes this, <laughs> as I like to say, jumble sale, you know, a yard sale of junk lying on a table <laughs> with lots of gaps and weird things stuck together and things that don't belong together and incoherent and not closed, so very porous. So that's one sense in which you could say the adept has no fixed heart-mind, that there's no fixed sense of the small self, and there's not the attempt to create that fixed sense. Because most of us would say, well, I don't have a fixed sense of self either, but I'm trying to get one. (laughs) So most of us would say, I'm still trying to figure out who I am, or I feel all these gaps in myself, or I feel confused, or I blah, blah, blah. But then the struggle is to somehow fix those gaps or fill those gaps or fix the story or polish up the surface or make the inner self feel more dense and solid and permanent. (laughs) So the adept's not doing that either. And then another way we could understand that first line that the adept has no fixed heart mind is that the adept, and when they say the adept, they just mean someone with spiritual accomplishment that the adept has no fixed concepts about things. So this has to do with entering into situations fresh and new each time, rather than carrying with us our very thick Coke bottle lenses of all of our beliefs and convictions and must-haves and can't-haves 
and our various karmas related to the six realms that also hugely color how we interpret things. So as we become more awake, we start to lose those lenses and we start to lose those strong convictions about everything. And so then when we approach a circumstance or each moment, we have no fixed heart and mind about that moment or that new circumstance that's arising around us like a three-dimensional mandala. And we can just, with our senses open, respond. And of course, Ma, to call this chaos, it's like improvisation. Improvisation is the very most perfect way to describe having no fixed heart mind. When we have fixed heart mind, we aren't improvising any longer. We're applying something to a circumstance that is already preformed. Sometimes it seems to work. Other times we realize it hasn't worked at all. But a lot of the time, most of the time, it's not really working and we don't realize it because it's so normalized. Or it's working in such a limited way that we don't have a sense of the larger circumstance that could have been related to differently and brought a richer result than the one that we got. So it might seem like, oh, I said the right thing to somebody and they had a good response. But maybe if we had approached it without fixed heart mind, there would have been a magical response or a, a, a different response or a bigger response from the whole mandala of circumstances. We just don't know, though, because we're primed and trained to only expect very limited things from our lives. And then we're at least temporarily somewhat satisfied with those very limited things until we realize how limited they are or until we just want a fix of the next thing like that. (laughs) Like we orchestrate some situation so that we get approval from somebody. And that feels good, but then five minutes later we want that again. And so we have to keep doing that. This is fixed heart mind. So the adept has no fixed heart mind, but makes the heart mind of the people his own. That's a kind of mysterious line. It has something to do with perception, right? If we're not defending ourselves and we don't have a fixed position and we are being more porous, then we can feel more of what's going on around us and with other beings, right? But then what do we do with that? It has to do with being responsive. So the fundament of actual beingness is wisdom virtues such as compassion. And that is why, even though the Lord created this madhouse, as Ma calls it, you know, Ma said the Lord created an absolute madhouse. And I think we can vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> so even though you, you might think, well, the Lord created this madhouse, why would the Lord then run around embodying beings that feel all this compassion. If you're in trouble, but you're me and I'm you, and there isn't really a you, why would I feel compassion for anything, right? Or anything, really. But the fact of the matter is that this is actually made of those virtues, like compassion, primordial intelligence, and clarity, and playfulness. So this reality can do nothing but respond that way when liberated from all of these limitations. That's what is liberated, are those wisdom virtues. So the adept has no fixed heart mind, but makes the heart mind of the people his own, means to be in a state of utter responsivity and moving with that river of compassion. There isn't any more self-concern in the limited way that we think of it all the many, many ways that we experience self-concern. But there is this universalized compassion or universalized love or universalized desire to be of benefit or just being of benefit, universal being of benefit. You're moved to do that. So when we think of desire, we think of something that moves us, right? Like the very 
feeling of desire is like a river. It's like something that has force, right? It's Shakti. So although the desire of the Lord is not like our individual desire in the sense that it's so focused on one small thing, there is a desire that impels this beneficence to be expressed within everything that we call duality, all of these things, all these beings that are showing up. So the adept has no fixed heart-mind and therefore is free to be moved by this river to be of benefit to others, right? Mm -hmm. To make the heart-mind of the people his own, meaning to make the concerns, to make the life of other people his own or her own or their own, right? But that happens automatically for the adept. He's not trying to do it. That's right. Any kind of trying would be, you know, better than nothing, but <laughs> but not the real thing, right? Not the full thing, not necessarily the skillful thing. I mean, we all have the experience sometimes that when we try to be loving or try to be compassionate or try to be have clarity or try to act with skill, we completely flub up, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> And then we wonder how that happened, right? I was trying so hard. Why did that happen? But that happens because it isn't coming effortlessly. It's not coming spontaneously. We haven't yet taken off all of our lenses. We still have lots of conditions and restrictions uh, and lots and lots and lots of blind spots. We do occasionally have those flashes of enlightened self coming out of us. <laughs> But for the most part, whatever is coming out is quite limited and and effortful. You know, one of the questions I get a lot in satsang is, you know, is how can I be more compassionate toward such and such a person in some situation? (laughs) You can't. You're as compassionate as you are. And you're stuck with that until you you wake up a little more. It also feels like empathy, because when I first heard that, I thought, oh, they're being empathetic. Like, but then it almost feels like that's still so limited in what this is describing. I think there's empathy in the sense of feeling what other people are feeling, mm-hmm. but not from a distance. It, again, it has a, some kind of like a force, like it, it moves you like in improvisational dance. It just moves you, mm-hmm. and then you just do something. You just say something, or you just don't do something. Mm-hmm. You know, you're you're just moved to participate in this that's been created by the larger self. And, and really, the symbol of improvisational dance or music is absolutely key, and you know should be thought about a lot mm-hmm. because if you're doing improvisational dance or music, and you pause to think what should I do, or how can I make this look good? Mm -hmm. The other dancers and musicians have already moved on, Mm -hmm. and now you're out of sync. You know, when you're playing in an improvisational way, you just have to let yourself be moved. And it can be quite terrifying, because you do have to open yourself in a certain way and take leap after leap after leap, Mm -hmm. right? Of course, I don't think that Ma felt terrified when she was moving through the world, but I think for us, being in that state of non-consideration of self and just Mm -hmm. being immersed in an experience and responding, it's like we're leaving a whole thing behind in order to be able to do that. My experiences of improvisational dance or music is that there's this like feeling of total listening and like continually throwing oneself off a cliff. (laughs) So the adept has no fixed heart-mind, but makes the heart-mind of the people his own. Uh, And then the next part is the adept trusts the trustworthy, but also trusts the untrustworthy. By this, the nature of trust is understood. This is Taoist text. What does the word Tao mean? It means the way. It doesn't really mean a path. It means the way of reality, how reality is. Or it has a sense of movement. 
it means the flow of the essence of things or the essence of things. Mm. It's a word that you can't really pin down because there's no real word for that. Mm. So it is saying everything is that. Everything is the Tao. Mm. Everything is that movement of essence. Mm. And so the trustworthy and the untrustworthy are on one level the same, but also both expressive of the Tao. They're both the Tao. Or we would say they're both the self. I don't know that Taoism would say that. I'm not sure. I don't know enough about it. But that when we are addressing people in our lives, when I say addressing, I mean being oriented toward people in some circumstance, that there's always wisdom present in the same measure. So whether we're being treated well or badly, whether someone's keeping their word or breaking their word, whether we're getting what we want or we're not getting what we want, whether the situation is pleasant or uncomfortable, the Tao, or you could say the wisdom of this animated reality, is present in equal measure in all those situations. And when you realize this, you realize the the real nature of what is trust. Trust isn't something that you only give in a relative sense to people who live up to your expectations or keep their promises. Trust is something you give to every circumstance, and it's what I call confidence, not trust. If you have that connection to flowing presence or living presence, the Tao, then everything is that, and you can have absolute confidence in the wisdom of whatever situation is arising. Sometimes when people hear this kind of teaching, they think, well, That means in every situation, if I find the wisdom, then everything will work out. You know, somehow I'll find the wisdom and everything will be the way I want it to be. (laughs) It doesn't work like that. That part of it has to do with the real meaning of surrender, which is surrendering to the reality of what circumstance actually is. Because if you do that, you can have no complaints. You can't say that anything happened was wrong. You can't say that you've been betrayed. You can't say that someone broke their word. right? You can't say that someone hurt me. You can say, I feel hurt, sure. (laughs) But you can't condemn others. Mm -hmm. There could not be punishment in a world where we recognize that trustworthiness and untrustworthiness were both the Tao were both equal expressions of wisdom. We could we simply couldn't punish people. We could protect ourselves in a relative sense from people who were causing harm. But we could have no anger toward people who caused harm. Because we'd ha- we would have to instantly recognize that those people were also equal expressions of wisdom and that we can have confidence that there is beneficence in every situation whether or not we can fully suss it out. And of course, our explanations are always going to, going to be partial. If someone hears this teaching, every circumstance is equally expressive of wisdom, completely equally, we can't pull apart situations and say, I see wisdom in this part, and I see this kind of wisdom over here, and oh yes, I benefited from this in this way, and it all worked out in the end. That way of relating to the equality of circumstances, which is really the equality of wisdom appearing in every circumstance, is like applying a dualistic karmic vision to the absolute. just doesn't really work that way. Because when when we give those kind of explanations, we have not really yielded to circumstance. Yielding to circumstance means also yielding to just feeling badly about circumstances. It means that even our own feelings about circumstances are also expressions of wisdom. It means that there really is nothing to be fixed. And this is at the heart of the teaching about there isn't anything to be fixed. And in a sense, recognizing this means just going along with reality moment to moment with an open heart mind, with this unfixed heart, mind, 
and just whatever happens is fine. And this was, of course, one of Ma's main teachings. Whatever happens is fine. It doesn't mean whatever happens, I'll feel fine. (laughs) Unfortunately. (laughs) Maybe in some far-flung timeless time will be awake enough so that we'll feel fine no matter what's happening. <laughs> but I, I certainly haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> so this is why the trustworthy and the and the untrust trustworthy are the same and this is the real nature of trust. The real nature of trust is trusting in the Tao or trusting in the trusting in wisdom. What I call having confidence in wisdom. And that can really only come out of seeing, feeling, and encountering wisdom over time through our practice and in whatever other way that we can. Having a palpable experience with that pervasive wisdom. All of us have a little bit of experience with it or we wouldn't be here. But the trick is to have a continuous experience of it. And then we still have some karmas, and we still have rises and falls in how we feel about things, and karma still arise. But at that point, when our experience of the Tao of living wisdom is more continuous, we can be much more easy about our own karmas. It's also seeing them, understanding in a real embodied way that they are also expressions of living wisdom. And even if we get upset about them, and even if we falter in our practice, or we think we're on top of the spiritual world, and then something happens and we completely lose it, or all the things that go on. Even when those things happen, if we have enough of a continuous connection with living presence, even those things become less scary and less dangerous for us. Because even those things we recognize as expressions of this wisdom so we can have a lighter attitude even as we might still be suffering in various ways or uh, being hit too hard by circumstances being too affected by what happens it becomes quite interesting for instance when we're right now we're living in a time when there's just the outcomes of the wholesale destruction of our environment are becoming very obvious and very scary. And our whole way of life is threatened. And our leaders are mad. It becomes quite an interesting time to be doing this kind of practice. And having feelings of, I'm just speaking of myself, you know, having feelings of grief or at the same time that, I, that having a very deep sense that nothing is actually wrong. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> that those things exist at at the same time. What if the seaboards go underwater? What's that going to be like? And what if there's food shortages? And what if, what if, what if nuclear reactors get destroyed and our health is even more impaired than it is? Even that seemingly horrific kind of scenario, which isn't really out of the question at this point, (laughs) becomes easier to live with. The whole passage is, the adept has no fixed heart-mind, but makes the heart-mind of the people his own. The adept trusts the trustworthy, but also trusts the untrustworthy. By this, the nature of trust is understood. Mm -hmm.